Hi, welcome to Evidence for Faith. I am so glad you are with me today. Hope you're having a great day as we are continuing in our study here uh, on the why are there so many translations of the Bible. And today we're going to be looking at the Good News Translation. The Good News Translation. I mentioned this um, in a couple of lessons before, uh, just uh, as um, we were doing, because they were sort of related, uh, uh, this with one of the other translations. Um but this one here is a very easy translation to read, as you're going to see. The readability on this is only in sixth grade. But let's get into the Good News translation. And starting off, let's do like we have been. Let's take a look at Psalm 23. If you have your Bibles, you want to follow along in your translation. Or if, you want to, uh, if you're at a computer or something, you can pull this up on like Bible Hub or Bible Gateway and read it along with me. That is fine. That's, that'd be great to do. But... You can just sit there and listen as I'm going to read it. So this is Psalm 23 out of the Good News Translation. The Lord, our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and your house will be my home as long as I live. So that's Psalm 23 out of the Good News Translation. Now, the Good News Translation dates back to 1976. That is when it was first completed as the Bible, the whole Bible itself. It was revised in 1992. But um, I still see, in some cases, you can still get hold of a, a 1976 edition of this. It is a dynamic or thought-for-thought -thought equivalent. So that's the type of translation it is. It is dynamic. Though there are people, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, there are some that they don't view it that way. They view it more as a glorified paraphrase. But technically, if you read the preface and stuff, it says right in here, it's a dynamic thought-for-thought -thought equivalence. Now, why, why did the American Bible Society, because they're the ones who first published this, why did they feel like, oh, we need another translation? Well, let's go back in time a little bit to the, to the 1960s. In the 1960s, there were not that many English translations. I mean, today we have hundreds of them, but back then there were very few um, that were available and easy to get hold of. I mean, there was the King James Version, of course. You had the Revised Standard. You had the American Standard. There were a few others, but those were the most common ones. As I say, there were some others that were um, were out in the um, in that time period, and, but many were just coming and, and being born at this time. Some were just being made, and this is one of these. In, in 1966, the American Bible Society decided to publish a very simple, everyday English version, and they did this just with the New Testament to start with, and it was called Good News for Modern Man. Matter of fact, I had one of these, and actually, I think I've had two in my life. But I had one um, when I was in um, like eighth grade or something like that. And I know it was the Bible I carried around with me when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, the Good News for Modern Man. The thing is, it was just the New Testament. I remember it even, it was a paperback, uh, black and white cover, and it, it had stick-like drawings or line drawings of people and biblical events and stuff. Very simplistic. But I, I liked that, and I used to carry that around and read it when I was a freshman because it was so easy to understand. Well, because it was so popular, and I mean, good news for a modern man, it was extremely popular, particularly with teens, um, that the uh, American Bible Society was encouraged to make an Old Testament copy um, version to go along with it, which then would have a complete Bible. And that's how they did this. It took them about 10 years to wake up and smell the coffee on this to, to actually get started in doing it. And they finished it in 1976. So it, it was 10 years from when the first one uh, came out. 
and they called it, when it came out, the Good News Bible. Now, as I said, what we had before, 10 years before this, was the good news for modern man. That was just the New Testament. When the whole Bible was completed, it was called the Good News Bible. Um, but after a while, that name sort of uh, faded out of popularity, so they, they renamed it to, to try and get people as a marketing ploy, I guess, more or less, and they called it the Today's English Version, commonly called the, or uh, abbreviated the TEV. Matter of fact, there are some Bible apps that I have on my computer that's still listed as the TEV. I think this happened around 2005 or so uh, that they, they did this uh, renaming of it. Um, but that didn't seem to catch on as well either. So then they changed it again to Good News Translation, the GNT, as a lot of times it's abbreviated, the GNT, uh, and that is what it's basically called today. So if you look one up, or if you're gonna type it into a computer and do a search to buy one or something, uh, you wanna look for Good News Translation. That's what it is. The goal, as I said now, the whole thing here was trying to produce a very easy to read version of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text the Bible's composed in um, that anyone, regardless of background, could read. That was their goal, that anybody could pick this up and read it. That's why it was put on a sixth grade reading level. And I've run this through three different type of tests, and always it comes right around, uh, always in the sixth grade uh, reading level there. Now, how did it get translated? Well, there was a, a Southern Baptist minister whose name was Dr. Robert G. Bratcher. And uh, he was the one who was principally in charge of putting this translation together. He, with six other colleagues of his, they decided to, to start putting this and, and working on this as a complete Bible. So what they did is they went back to the, the um, one of the Masoretic uh, text, the one they used specifically for this was the Biblia Hebraica uh, Stuttengartensia. Um, we've mentioned this one before. It's a, a very good Masoretic text. And for the New Testament, they used the Greek New, New Testament that was published by the United Bible Societies. And the one that they used was the third edition. If you're familiar with these manuscripts and stuff, that's what they used. So those two sources, they had an Old Testament, they had a New Testament source, and that's what they used to put this together. Um, sadly, that is the only things basically that they used. Even in the preface of the Bible, it says that these were the two that were used in doing this. So unlike other translations that they have used in many cases, numerous manuscripts, this one did, did not get that. And as I say, it, the person in charge of it they, they, um, was a Southern Baptist, and it was accepted by uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and so they used it, they, they promoted it and stuff. And soon after publication, because it was so popular when it came out, um, there was an Anglican version, there was a Roman Catholic version, and they even made an Orthodox version of this Bible. Now, what's so unique about it? Well, I've mentioned it already about four or five times. This is one of the easiest Bibles to read. It is simple to read, and it's sort of entertaining as you read it. That's what they wanted. They wanted something so easy, and it would keep people's attention, and it does. In some of the the um, the way that the modern language of English was, was back in the 70s, they kept it in that range. And so it has that type of a flair to it. Um, and like I say also, when it was first published, there were very few English translations that were easy to read. So when this thing hit the market, wow, the sales escalated. And it is still a, a popular Bible today. As a matter of fact, I looked up just to see how many copies, I was wondering how many copies of this thing has been sold since 1976. I found out that over 244 million copies of this Bible has been made. It's become very popular, well, at least it did. It was very, very popular in the United Kingdom. Um, but that is just such an interesting thing I, I find about it. Now, what's the problems with it? Hmm. Well, first of all, you probably caught this already. Because of the small number of scholars working on this translation and the use of only um, like a very, very small source of manuscripts uh, to compare, <laughs> or to write from, uh, many pastors and colleagues just refer to this as a glorified paraphrase, that it's not a true translation. I mean, 
as we've talked about with some other translations where they have over a hundred scholars working on this and from different denominations and things, this was not like this. There were seven total, six uh, besides um, Dr. Branchard who, who put it together, who was the, the chairman of it. So it was, it's very small. Um, it, it doesn't have a lot of things. And matter of fact, in some books and articles that I have that use this translation, they'll take verses from it, they actually stick in the footnotes in some of them or on their charts that they don't even list it as a dynamic uh, translation. They sort of put it over into the paraphrase. And I think that's a little strong, um, but they say it's not a true translation because of that. Um, but not everybody agrees with that. It still, it carries the name translation and it, it it is more than one person doing it. So anyway, a second problem that you see with this, and this one is more serious, in making this so easy to read, and at times it is really dynamic, it, it is so thought for thought, what happens is it loses some of the intended meanings of ancient texts um, that we have. Uh, I, I hate to say it that way, but that's what it does. It does distort some of the meaning of um, the ancient manuscripts. This is why, again, some people regard this as a glorified paraphrase and not a scholarly translation. I, I don't know many people who would call it a scholarly translation due to the few people doing it. Matter of fact, there are some verses um, contained in here, particularly in the New Testament, that it does not conform with what God is actually saying. There's some in the Old Testament like that too, um, that, that can lead to false doctrines, especially concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a couple of verses in there that, hmm, really, this is what they're saying? Um, it, it could give you an impression Jesus has a sinful nature. Uh, and it, they didn't mean to do it that way, but that's how they phrased it to make it easy to understand. And so you see, in, in trying to take the Word of God and making it understandable, sometimes you, if when you get away from doing word for word, you start running into paraphrasing and bias and stuff, and they ran into this. Well, let's take a look at, um, it's, it's not always like that, but let's take a look at Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13. One of the um, passages, a passage we have used in every one of these uh, lessons. Let's see how this one takes a look at the, the doctrinal information we find here. So uh, this is Titus 2, 11 through 13 out of the Good News translation. It reads, For God has revealed his grace for the salvation of all people. That grace instructs us to give up ungodly living and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this world as we wait for the blessed day we hope for when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will appear. Now, I don't think many people find anything doctrinally wrong with that. They've taken some of the words in terms that are um, that we have seen in a word-for-word -word translation. They've just made it more understandable. So in this passage that we've been looking at, I don't see anything majorly of concern here. I think it's pretty sound. So just a couple of parting comments with you on this translation. The, the Good News translation, it, as I said, it was a bestseller. In, in the late 1970s, wow, and it was so popular with teens. I remember I was not the only person in my high school or even in my youth group that had one of these. Um, we, I remember sitting in Sunday school, uh, Sunday school class and a lot of us having um, this as our New Testament as we were studying. It was endorsed, as I mentioned, by Billy Graham in his Crusades once it came out. Matter of fact, I'm pretty certain that's where I got mine. Um, it was popular, as I said, too, in the United Kingdom. And in 1991, I looked some stats up on how well it sold and stuff. And back in 1991, it was the most popular Bible in the UK. Mm, that was interesting to me. I had no idea it was that popular over there. It was also used in the making of the film Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was a film that was made in, in 2003, and they used the Good News Translation as um, the basis of their screenplay that they put together. So it was, if you've seen that on television or something or a video of it, this is what they used. Um, and so the wording and stuff in there comes from this translation. I thought that was interesting. But because the problems mentioned um, with this translation, I do not recommend this as a primary study Bible. I, I, I just can't do that or one that a person would use for a deep personal study of the Word of God. I cannot recommend this one for that. 
there are so many better versions that are out there for that. Um, but it can be used as a comparison Bible uh, for reading. Uh, remember when I have said this many times before too in, in many lessons that I've done, when you do your Bible study, just don't read out of one. Uh, read out of different uh, translations to get a good feel. Um, and I even mentioned in one of our studies, you know, what's, what's good Bibles to do this? And at the beginning of this, we sort of talk about this, that there are certain ones that I really recommend. This is not one I recommend as your primary, but you can use this as a, I, I do recommend it, reading it for a comparison, but just bear in mind that it's not, I repeat, not one of the most accurate versions out there. So that's the good news uh, translation, and um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I um, just got a comment a, a little bit ago, just before I came into the studio here, from a person who's saying that they are so enjoying listening to this series. They've been learning so much about different translations, because they were puzzled too. Why are there so many translations? And I got a really interesting note from a person saying, this is helping them so much in, in sorting through what is a good translation to study from, what's a good one to use, and just knowing where some of these came from when they talk with their friends, that this series has helped out a lot. And we love to hear from you. If you, you too have comments, um, if this has helped you or whatever, we would love to know about that. So please contact us. We love to have information sent to us. Um, you can find us um, at evidenceforfaith.org, and there's a place there you can make comments and stuff. So. There's only one lesson left, and, and I hope you'll join me for that one. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.